Hello everyone and welcome to our ACP 2021 Adult Immunization Series. I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer, liaison to ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and a member of ACIP's COVID-19 Vaccine Workgroup. This episode details mRNA COVID vaccines, their safety, efficacy, and dosing, who should get them, who should not, and what to expect after vaccination. I think we can safely say Operation Warp Speed has lived up to its name. Things have happened fast. Large-scale studies have been well-designed and recruited. FDA has delivered transparency in the process. FDA's Dr. Stephen Hahn withstood White House pressure to release a vaccine too early. We now have two mRNA vaccines that are over 90% effective. We also have other vaccine platforms in the pipeline, hopefully coming soon. To review, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. COVID-19 is the disease it causes. The spike proteins on the viral surface are the main target for vaccine development. Let's pause to reflect on where we were when this started and where we have come. The first alert sounded little more than a year ago, December 31st, New Year's Eve, 2019. A mysterious cluster of pneumonia cases was reported in Wuhan, China. January 21st, the first confirmed case hit the U.S. And by January 31st, 2020, things were really heating up. Secretary Azar declared a public health emergency. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. On December 8, 2020, as COVID vaccine cases in the U.S. topped 15 million, the U.K. started vaccinating. The next day, warnings erupted from the U.K. about several severe allergic reactions within minutes of receiving the vaccine. We'll come back to this later. On December 11, 2020, near the stroke of midnight, mRNA vaccines had their Cinderella moment. Pfizer-BioNTech's mRNA vaccine got the green light for those aged 16 and older and became America's first COVID vaccine and the first mRNA vaccine ever to win FDA's emergency use authorization. Two doses of Pfizer's vaccine given 21 days apart are 95% effective at preventing COVID. One week later, on December 18th, another holiday treasure. FDA authorized emergency use of a second COVID vaccine, Moderna's mRNA vaccine for those 18 and older. Two doses of Moderna's vaccine given 28 days apart are 94.1% effective at preventing COVID. Media reports chronicled Pfizer-BioNTech's complicated cold chain storage challenges. It has to be stored frozen, ultra cold, and super freezers at negative 70 degrees C, making vaccine distribution and administration cold, complex, and cumbersome. You're not gonna find these super freezers in most physician offices. Moderna's vaccine is also stored frozen, but at regular freezer temperatures around negative 20 degrees C. Its cold chain requirements are much more user-friendly. Moderna's vaccine can remain stable at 2 to 8 degrees C, the temperature of a standard refrigerator for up to 30 days, and at room temperature for up to 12 hours. Both vaccines must be thawed before going into arms. Pfizer's vaccine has to be reconstituted, Moderna's does not. Both Pfizer-BioNTech's mRNA BNT162 COVID vaccine and Moderna's mRNA-1273 COVID vaccine are nucleic acid vaccines. Both contain messenger RNA, which instructs the body's own cells to make the protein antigen, the COVID-19 spike protein, which then triggers the immune response. Understand that mRNA vaccines are new, but not unknown. Researchers have been studying them for decades. In early January, 2020, Chinese researchers posted the genetic sequence of this new coronavirus on the internet. The vaccine companies went to work right away. And thanks to research on SARS back in 2002, 
then MERS, a decade later, scientists knew to focus on the spike protein. They knew how to purify the mRNA and how to stabilize it and protect it from degrading too quickly. The secret, a protective lipid nanoparticle coating. Phase three studies of both these mRNA vaccines are huge. 44,000 for the Pfizer vaccine, 30,000 participants for the Moderna vaccine. The trials included patients with the diverse backgrounds of race, ethnicity, age, both young and old, as well as those with underlying medical conditions, most commonly obesity, diabetes, and lung disease. The companies put their protocols and their diversity breakdown on their website. FDA has also been very transparent in its requirements. mRNA vaccines don't contain live virus, so they can't cause an infection. They can't give someone COVID. mRNA vaccines do not affect or interact with our own DNA in any way. The messenger RNA never enters the nucleus of the cell and it doesn't hang around. The body breaks it down within hours. I wanna direct you to a fabulous resource on the CDC website, Interim Clinical Considerations. It's a live document, so it's constantly updated and fine-tuned as new information comes in. It's very user-friendly and shows the date of their last update and also summarizes the most recent changes. It's certainly worth checking every day or so. Now for dosing details. Both vaccines require two doses IM. 21 days apart for Pfizer's vaccine, 28 days apart for the Moderna vaccine. Current CDC guidance allows a four-day grace period for giving the second dose early. CDC says there's no maximal interval between the doses for either vaccine. Vaccine efficacy after two doses is 94 to 95%. You need both doses for optimal protection and you need to use the same product for both doses. mRNA COVID vaccines are not interchangeable, so no mixing and matching. You may have seen some recent articles and reports that suggest creatively dicing the dosing as a way to stretch vaccine supply and immunize more people. Proposals include reducing the number of doses, extending the time between doses, using half a dose rather than a whole dose, on Tuesday, January 4th, 2020, three articles in the Annals of Internal Medicine supported altered dosing schedules. That same day, January 4th, FDA released a statement that basically said, hold your horses, don't do it. Stick with the science and what's been studied. Making these changes is premature, quote, making such changes that are not supported by adequate scientific evidence may be ultimately counterproductive to public health. Using a single dose regimen or administering less than the dose studied in the clinical trials could affect duration of protection. People might then wrongly assume they're fully protected when they're not and might alter their behavior and take unnecessary risks. Duration of protection, even with two full doses, is still unknown. Stay tuned. Who should get it? Pfizer-BioNTech's vaccine is FDA authorized for those 16 and older. Moderna's vaccines authorized starting at age 18. Those with chronic medical conditions like obesity, diabetes, and lung disease should get it. They were included in studies. Immunocompromised persons were not studied, but may receive it, but it may not work as well. Persons with autoimmune disorders were included in the trial. There is not yet any data, but they may receive it. Pregnant and lactating women may receive it if they choose. They should discuss the pros and cons with their physician, including risk of exposure issues. In the Pfizer vaccine study, 23 women have become pregnant, and the Moderna study, 13 women have. They will be closely followed. Here's a comparison of mRNA vaccine components. Each vaccine also contains an array of salts, sugars, and buffers. Please note that mRNA vaccines don't contain egg, they don't contain gelatin, they don't have any preservatives, the vaccine vial stoppers don't contain latex. Each vaccine has four lipid ingredients that make up its protective lipid nanoparticle, which forms a bubbly little cushion around fragile mRNA to protect it and give it time to do its job. 
As you can see, both vaccines do contain polyethylene glycol, PEG. There are patients who should not get it. Here are the no-nos. This nice color-coded table is on the CDC website. Contraindications are in red. mRNA vaccines are contraindicated if you have a history of a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis to a previous dose of mRNA COVID vaccine or to any of its components, including PEG, that's polyethylene glycol, or if you're allergic to polysorbate, which is not a vaccine ingredient, but is known to cause cross-reactive hypersensitivity with PEG. PEG is also the primary ingredient in laxatives, including Miralax, as well as colonoscopy preps, including Go Lightly, Colite, and Movie Prep. Precautions are in yellow. History of an immediate allergic reaction to any vaccine or injectable therapy is a precaution for vaccination at this time. An immediate allergic reaction includes symptoms such as urticaria, angioedema, respiratory distress, or anaphylaxis within four hours following administration. Injectable is a key word here. It is not a contraindication, just a precaution. This does not include allergic reactions to foods, pet dander, venom, oral medications, latex, egg, or gelatin, which are in the green column. You can proceed with vaccination. Those with history of immediate allergic reaction would need to be evaluated and cleared by an allergist before being vaccinated. If you have an immediate allergic reaction to the first dose of MRA vaccine, you should not receive a second dose. People with precautions or any history of anaphylaxis have to sit and be observed for 30 minutes after vaccination. Everyone has to sit and be observed for at least 15 minutes, so warn your patients to plan their time accordingly. There were no observed cases of anaphylaxis in either of the large mRNA vaccine trials, but remember those allergic reactions in the UK? We're seeing them here too. A new report in MMWR reports at least 21 cases of anaphylaxis occurred in the first 1.9 million Pfizer doses. This translates to 11.1 .1 cases of anaphylaxis per 1 million COVID cases. To put this into context, for flu vaccination, the anaphylaxis rate is only 1.3 per million. CDC's Dr. Nancy Massonier says, quote, even at 11 cases per million doses administered, it's a very safe vaccine. It's still a good value proposition for someone to get vaccinated. CDC also has a helpful list of recommended medications, including epinephrine and antihistamines and other supplies to have on hand at COVID-19 vaccination sites, just in case. CDC does not recommend routine pre-medication for those with history of allergic reaction. Except for pregnant women, CDC also does not recommend routine prophylactic NSAIDs or acetaminophen due to lack of information on their impact on vaccine-induced antibody response. If you've already had COVID, can you get the vaccine? Yes, it's safe and likely efficacious, but understand current evidence suggests reinfection is uncommon in the 90 days after initial infection. You don't have to get tested before getting vaccinated. If you have COVID now, when should you get vaccinated? Wait until you're recovered and out of quarantine. But again, reinfection is uncommon in the 90 days after initial infection. If you received monoclonal antibody or convalescent serum, wait at least 90 days so the treatment won't interfere with vaccine immune response. If you've had a known exposure to COVID and still in quarantine, when should you get vaccinated? Wait until your quarantine is over before getting vaccinated. That way you won't risk making the vaccinators and others sick. Can COVID vaccine be given in combination with other vaccines? CDC says try not to, but getting a tetanus booster for wound management or measles or hep A vaccine during an outbreak is okay. But CDC says try to allow a minimum two week window from other vaccine doses if you can. After getting a vaccine, will you test positive for COVID? Well, it depends upon the test. The vaccine will not interfere with diagnostic tests like PCR, nucleic acid amplification or antigen tests, but it does affect serology. The vaccine induces antibodies to the spike proteins, 
and so does natural infection. So if you're testing serology to look for past infection, check for antibody specific to nucleocapsid protein. These vaccines are reactogenic, so expect symptoms. Vaccine side effects usually start the day after vaccination. CDC has put together a toolkit for healthcare providers that has guidance on helping to decide if symptoms are due to COVID or just a side effect of vaccination. Some of the vaccine reactions are the same as COVID symptoms, so COVID may have to be ruled out. For some, getting this vaccine will be no walk in the park, especially for the second dose. Patients who get it will know they've had a vaccine. For full protection, you need that second dose. Make sure patients know what to expect. Be open, honest, and transparent. This builds confidence and trust. Expect mild to moderate local and systemic reactions. Pain, swelling, redness at the injection site, as well as localized axillary lymphadenopathy on the same side as the vaccinated arm. Expect fever, fatigue, headache, chills, muscle aches, and joint aches you may have to skip work the day after vaccination. Most symptoms occur in the first three days after vaccination. Reactions are more intense after the second dose and symptoms are worse and younger as compared to older patients. But you can think of these symptoms as a sign that the vaccine is working. The good news is symptoms seem to resolve within one to three days. You may want to get vaccinated before you have one or two days off though. So that's the scoop on mRNA vaccines. Having a vaccine will not end this pandemic if people are not willing to take it. So we have to get vaccine into arms and we must remember this. Physician recommendation is the most effective motivator for vaccination. If we recommend it, if we get it, most of our patients will also get vaccinated. And finally, vaccines don't save lives, vaccinations do. Lead by example, get vaccinated, and spread the word. One more reminder, you and everybody else have to keep wearing masks and staying socially distanced even after you're vaccinated. We're still not sure how much or if mRNA vaccines reduce transmission and just how long protection lasts. Only time and more study will tell. For the American College of Physicians, I'm Dr. Sandra Freihofer.